Welcome, Cyrus. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. I know we're all really excited to hear from you today. Um, so I guess the first question we're going to go for is a really fun one, because I'm sure everyone watching is curious about your scholarly beginnings. How did you get to doing, and your artistic beginnings and your activist beginnings, how did you get to being the fabulous person that you are? <laughs> uh, well, thank you for saying that. And thanks for letting me uh, join all of you today. Um, I just want to say I'm, I'm, um, I'm in the unceded territory of the Mississaugas as a credit shout out and very thankful for the chance to be here. I've been involved in the arts for a really long time. I got involved uh, making art as a young kid. Uh, my mom's an artist, my grandmother's an artist. Uh, my dad was involved in the arts and so I was really encouraged to do creative practice from a really young age. So I feel very thankful. So uh, really a big shout out to uh, my grandmother and my mom and my dad for making space for creativity. I knew students when I did art school, I went to art school um, and I knew students who had to, to tell their parents that they were in business, you know, and just kind of hope for the best when graduation came, you know, because they weren't supported in being in the arts. So I feel really thankful to have been supported in in this medium. And then I started making art professionally about 25 years ago, around the same time that I started getting involved in activism and organizing. So 1995, 1996, I was um, living out in Musqueam, Squamish and Soil Tooth Territories in Vancouver. And um, got involved in, in organizing in sort of feminist uh, art spaces and uh, uh, ended up moving back uh, to Takarondo and got really involved in abolition work and prison abolition work and prison organizing in the mid 90s and early 2000s and mad organizing and disability justice organizing and making art all along, along the way. As I mentioned, I did go to art school. I was told my work was too overt because it talked about uh, white supremacy and racism explicitly. Uh, luckily, I didn't listen and kept making the work that I was making and you know, now make work that largely does talk about critical race theory and disability justice and trans justice. Um, so anyways, I've been doing uh, what I've been doing for about 25 years uh, and I write about what I make and I, and I engage in scholarship that tries to make uh, institutions a bit more welcoming for racialized and BIPOC artists. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm really thankful to, to have these overlapping ways that, you know, you can bring art activism and scholarship together. Yeah. I, I'm still processing the two overt thing, but I think it's a brilliant course title <laughs> or, or just like a future album cover or something just too overt. Um, but speaking of too overt, um, you know, this, this, what we wanted to do was sort of get a sense of, um, you know, why is trans studies important? What is trans studies to you? Trans studies is so important because we have, through processes of colonization, had a, an, an explicit erasure, an intentional erasure of trans histories, trans archives, trans narratives, trans stories, and um, we need to reclaim our narratives. We need to reclaim our lives, our stories, our, our histories, and be able to, to share this knowledge with each other. Um, so I really love uh, that we are now creating scholarship that is necessarily accessible to all the different kinds of trans people that are out there. So the trans studies that I've been involved in has tried to break away from some of the academic industrial complex and has tried to say, you know, what would it mean to create a scholarship for black trans women? What would it mean to create a scholarship that supported trans kids, you know, and, and doing things a bit differently in our classroom and making space for students to have these aha moments where they realize that they've been duped a bit about gender you know, and that there's other possibilities. I've, in my trans studies classes, have often had trans students, which feels like such a, um, an honor, a responsibility, uh, a thing to be a trans of color professor teaching to other trans students um, and wanting to make sure that they have the kind of experience in the academic industrial complex that allows them to thrive and not that makes them leave uh, academia running screaming, you know, which sometimes is too often the case for a lot of trans people in educational settings. So um, I've been really, uh, yeah, just really thinking about a radical trans studies, a trans studies that is for all of us. Um, and we need that now. And now we're seeing a moment in time where, 
you know, not only do we have the long lasting effects of a white supremacist transphobia that has affected all of us, you know, for generations, but we see this ramping up and this uprising of right wing methodology and, and theory that says that trans is, is necessarily something that needs to be criminalized. And so we're seeing the criminalization of trans bodies, trans healthcare, trans medicine, trans, uh, you know, parenting, uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of trans people are in a dangerous situation right now with the way that legislation is going and policy in the states and how that impacts us here in the north part of Turtle Island. And uh, so we need a space for us to come together and talk about all of this, document all of this, critique all of this, do the work that inspires generations to fight back. Um, you know, these courses can be spaces of irresistible revolution, right? So thankful for that. Niall, I know that you're next on our question list, but I hope you don't mind that I'm going to jump in here because I'd love to to stay in this place for a minute, Cyrus, and ask you the question, you know, I wonder what a trans pedagogy or trans pedagogies might mean to you in the context of being a trans thinker, educator, artist, and someone who's in community with other trans folks in academic contexts. Yeah, I think so much about what who and what we whose stories we tell how we tell them what what stories we tell and you know creating a pedagogy that is necessarily rooted and steeped in uh trans affirming space trans history trans knowledge so that the first reading on your course syllabus is probably going to be by a trans person of color because why wouldn't it be you know why wouldn't we start there or an indigenous two-spirit person or something you know that to really root our work in that kind of context that you know we create a classroom setting where all of the awkward cringy moments that we can have in classrooms as trans people the reading of the class list where they dead name you or the you know just you know people who don't get the pronouns in in the class like all of these moments don't happen because we've created a different kind of classroom environment where you know we all share our names that we want to share you know where pronoun use is really built into the context and the fabric of the course. Um, and then just really making sure that the curricula is, ref is reflective of, uh, you know, a diversity of trans voices, that it's not all white trans people, and that there are trans women and non-binary folks, you know, sharing their stories, and, and that all of that is part of it. So to me, I feel like we're creating um, a space of possibility uh, through a, a trans pedagogy because we're looking at everything outside of binary thinking. Uh, I think I, I, that's the hope, right? And so we're imagining a different kind of uh, classroom, we're imagining a different kind of space. Um, and I'm really, and then rooting it necessarily in justice, like trans justice. So, you know, we're also talking about race. We're also talking about abolition. We're also talking about disability because we're talking about justice. And as Marsha P. Johnson said, uh, you know, she said, if one gay person still has to march, there's no reason for any of us to be riding in cars celebrating. So like if we're talking about, if we know that there's still trans folks who don't have the resources and support they need to be able to thrive in this world, then we all have work to still do as trans people. And so we root that in our classroom environment and we, and we, and I think by doing that, we change the university. You know, we change, we transform the conditions through creating these semi-autonomous zones where radical pedagogy can thrive. In, in thinking about, um, sort of irresistible revolutions. I really liked that term. You just brought it up a bit earlier. It was it was poetic and beautiful. Um, a lot of the work that you have done um, has been about archives uh, and documenting sort of narratives, unearthing narratives um, that were previously silenced or erased. So let's begin with some of the, um, I guess the basics, um, because for our, our joint class, our joint joint class, um, one of the things our students are going to explore are, are trans archives, which brings us to the question, why are archives important? First, what do archives do for us or to us or with us? And then why are archives um, specifically important for BIPOC trans people? Well, you know, archives are are implicated in, in power dynamics in our society, absolutely. And they, um, you know, who and what gets remembered 
has a lot to do with who's in power at any given time. So the archive becomes this political space of uh, the act of remembering, which is which is a political thing, you know, of deciding who is worthy of having their things preserved, who is worthy of being remembered. Um, so I think a lot about that, and I do a lot of work around this idea of counter archiving, of archiving around the kitchen table, of archiving when we're having a conversation outside of Blocko, of archiving when we're telling and retelling stories from the 70s and 80s and 90s, and just that that, that archives don't only have to live in an air conditioned building, you know, that archives can be alive in our oral histories, in the sh stories told and retold. Um, but when we look at sort of the traditional archive structure, they, you know, there there is a problem. You know, there's a huge problem. Whether you're looking at the archives with a Q, whether you're looking at the City of Toronto archives, whether you're looking at, you know, any of these spaces, they often tell the story of a white of a white settler. You know, and that's the main narrative of who's in the archive. That's whose work gets collected. That's whose work is preserved. Um, and you know. That, that sets up a specific dynamic. So what we need is we need space for BIPOC histories to be remembered. You know, we need to to know about Jackie Shane and we need to know about how Blockarama started and we need to know about Funk Asia and we need to know about, I'm naming, you know, queer and trans sort of, or BIPOC, or, you know, spaces. Like we need to know about these places because as the Adinkra, you know, pictorial from the Ashanti people in Ghana and West Africa says, you know, Sankofa, it is important to go back and pick up that which you have forgotten. You know, this idea that, you know, we we learn from our past in order to go forward towards a future. And we want to have a future where there's BIPOC trans people thriving. We want to have a future where there's BIPOC queer people thriving. And so we have to be able to look at our past and how do we do that if it's not being collected and remembered. So I think a lot about people like Monica Forrester, who's a Black trans woman who started uh, uh, Trans Pride Toronto and who has been doing street-based outreach for 30 years. And I was talking to her about um, her archives and she was saying how she wished she had kept more things from the 70s and 80s but that they were so focused on survival you know that that was the the priority and i just think about the archive and it's like well no at that same time they were rapidly collecting all of these gay white men's um content and they could have collected her content at that same time but they didn't because of power dynamics so i'm here for counter archives i'm here for shaking up the traditional archives i'm here for creating a, you know the kind of space where where trans women of color could go and research their communities and find it there you know and there would be pictures and there'd be buttons and there'd be posters and there'd be all of the stuff that you can currently look up about white gay men's history that that would also be true for us um i really think that that's important um and as we move into this next sort of phase of humanity where we're trying to make different decisions uh, you know, we need to be able to document and chronicle what's happened before. So I'm really uh, hopeful, you know, we're seeing a shift, you know, the, the archives of the Q used to be called the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives. That, that says everything, you know, that trans wasn't even included in there. There wasn't any BIPOC reflection. Um, but also what needs to happen is that at these archives, they need to hire people of color, you know, they need to hire conservators and curators of color, because otherwise we're bringing our stuff to the archive and no one knows what to do with it or how to interpret it, because they haven't spent the time in our communities, they haven't necessarily gone to a blocko, they haven't necessarily done the research. And so, um, you know, I, I'm not confident that if I were to bring all of you know the banners for Blockarama to the archives with a queue, that they would be able to contextualize or talk about that work. Uh, I would love it if they would talk to someone in our communities. And so I think that there needs to be also a, a diversification of who it is who's deciding who and what we get to collect and remember. I love so much of what you're saying, and I think. One of the reasons that I remain so attached to your work is, is it, its ability to think both historically and back and toward a future and toward and your engagement with speculation and speculative futures as a critical part of activist practice and of abolitionist practice. And so could you speak to the role of speculation and 
the potentials of the connection between archives and futures, not just archives and pasts? Yeah, it's really, um, there's something beautiful. I love speculative fiction, speculative futures, imagining a different world being possible. Um, Walida Imarisha said that all activism was speculative fiction because we were daring to dream that another world was possible. Uh, Adrian Marie Brown talks about uh, speculative fiction as practicing the future, you know, and just this idea that we get to, um, you know, as Octavia Butler would say, touch, change, and shape what the future looks like through telling and retelling these stories and making movies and, you know, creating these fictions that offer a potential future. Is it possible for Black people or people of color to formulate visions of the future that are both liberating and purposeful? Of course. Oh. I mean, I don't even know what else to say about that. I mean, <laughs> we better. <laughs> Given the present situation of people of color around the world, shouldn't we be more concerned with dealing with the problems of the present rather than the future? Well, if that's what we do, then we'll go on having some pretty nasty problems in the future. Um, I had a, an acquaintance a while back whose daughter is not, um, um, she was at one of the, the schools that you really don't want your kid to go to. And the school was, they were trying to do some improving. And they were going to bring in language. This was an elementary school. They were going to bring in foreign language. And she was completely against it. She said, my kid doesn't speak English well enough to be learning some foreign language. Let her learn English first. Then she can learn a foreign language. And I tried to explain to her that one of the things that really helped me learn more about English was learning a bit of Spanish. And I mean, it helped me to be aware of things that I would not have been aware of in English, if, if I had only English to look at. And it was, to her, it was all nonsense. You know, her kid was supposed to learn the basics, and once she had the basics pounded into her, then she could learn something else if, if there was time. And I think that's the kind of um, thinking that, that is really do, doing a lot of harm to a lot of black people. You know, they're, they're so fixed in the present that they can't think towards the future. Anytime we try to envision a different world, a world without poverty, a world without prisons, a world without capitalism, without war, we are engaging in a practice of science fiction. But we think that when we can dream those realities together, that's when we can begin to build them right here and now in this time. And so we think that our movements for justice are incredibly great at critique, which is wonderful, and we need that, you know, but we also need to be able to offer alternatives. So we know what we don't want. We know what we're fighting against. What do we do want? Part of why I draw on that quote, we will win by Asada Shakur, is not because Asada Shakur believes necessarily that we will win, but we have to assume and work as if we will win. We spend so much time thinking about what's wrong, and we need to, because there's a lot that's wrong that needs to change. But in addition to pulling down walls, we also have to be planting the seeds. All of my work has been about watering the seeds. Through hope and through community and through practice and activism, we can start to craft the kind of world that we want to live in. Because I, I believe that, I have to believe that we will win. It's what we have. Um, yeah, I think it's really Im important in this moment, especially to be living into the speculative, because right now we're still living under the conditions of a capital, a racial capital system that, you know, our futures aren't all guaranteed. You know, many of us don't have guaranteed futures. And so we need to dream into a different kind of world, a future where trans kids can use any bathroom, you know, a future where trans people get to live long enough to become elders, a future where black affirming space is everywhere and black people have what they need to thrive, where, you know, disabled, deaf and mad people were considered inherently valuable. Like we need to dream into those futures to practice them, to live them, to birth them, to manifest them into a sort of a future possibility. Um, I think that archives, uh, you know, when they're working in their, their best moment, 
especially counter archives when they're working in their best moment. They're helping us to remember seven generations in the past, but also to see forward seven generations in the future. So when you're outside Blanco and you're telling that story that's been told over and over again about, you know, when so-and-so did some funny thing in 1997, you know, you're hopefully imagining future queers also hearing the story and dreaming into something different. Um, so we kind of tell, uh, you know, we, we get to um, build forward into uh, the imagined uh, future generations. I did a film project called Ancestors, Do You Read Us? Dispatches from the Future, which was largely rooted in archives. And so I went through film archives of all of these significant moments in Black um, uh, history context here in north in northern turtle island and southern turtle island and uh you know but 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 it was set in 2072 and it was set uh where it was this dispatch this love letter to our great great grandchildren and they were talking back to us as their ancestors so i think that about that a lot about archives and about thinking of ourselves as ancestors already ancestors to future generations and so what is it we want to leave them how do we want to be remembered and how do we want to, you know, what are the things that they're going to need to know in order to survive, you know, in a changed climate, you know, in a world affected by race wars, you know, in a world where, you know, we've built these largely inaccessible spaces, what do we need them to know to survive and what would we want to start saving now that they would be able to use going forward into the future and I think about seed stores and I think about you know all of the things that we need to do to kind of archive to to ensure a future survival. My name is Cyrus Marcus Ware and as an activist committed to the life of every being on this planet, as a Vanier scholar in environmental studies, as someone who spends a significant amount of time talking about climate change and environmental racism with my twin, Dr. Jessica Ware, an evolutionary geneticist and entomologist, as an artist and as a non-Indigenous person on largely unceded lands fighting in support of Indigenous resurgence, I desire a better nation, but I don't necessarily believe that this better will come in the form of a country. I will focus my talk today on these challenges. How do we do better and be better? What is it that we desire and in what format will this desire take? And who will help us get there? To this place of understanding and knowing towards a future wherein we all are living self-determined lives with a collective sense of community. To help me think through this question of desire, I have turned to the scholarship of Canadian Eve Tuck, who stated, desire is about longing about a present that is enriched by both the past and the future, end quote. And so I desire what I would normally do, what I love to do, what I spend my time in my activism, my art and my life doing is inspiring and weaving narratives of hope. This is where I would tell you how it's all going to be okay. But I think that perhaps the best response to our current condition is instead to have us sit with the discomfort of not knowing our way out of this one. To sit with the reality of the kinds of wicked conditions that allow for the deaths of Andrew Loku, Jermaine Carby, Sami Atin, and Abdirahman Abdi. To sit with the reality of the cuts to funding for the Black Coalition for AIDS Prevention in Toronto on the one hand, and the humorous repartee online about fundraising for an appropriation prize on the other. So instead of platitudes, I am instead, I am instead going to give you a list. I'm instead going to give you a list, a list that I think should be written on scrolls and rolled from coast to coast, a connected network of brilliant artists, journalists, and activists who have been doing this work and who are in the best possible position to tell their own stories and to share their own knowledge with all of us as we begin to articulate our shared desires for this beautiful nation. A list of brilliant black journalists, black artists who are helping us to imagine another world, who are telling our stories if we could just listen and experience their brilliance. I also am carrying with me a list of black activists whose names I cannot write down on pieces of paper or mention here because I love them too dearly and I value their safety and the stakes are actually that high. To all of you who are listed on this list, and the countless others who are doing this activist, journalist, and artistic work who I haven't mentioned, I want you to know that my answer is that I desire you. 
When I think about what I desire, I desire you. The fear of our desires keeps them suspect and indiscriminately powerful. For to suppress any truth is to give it strength beyond endurance. I mean, I love talking to you, Cyrus. And, and one of the things that I keep turning over with students and friends and colleagues is all of our complicit relations to these structures and institutional powers. What does it mean to be both an abolitionist and an academic? What does it mean to be buying into institutionally managed archival systems? How do we how do we negotiate the tensions of our multiple positions? And I'm curious how you engage conversations like that. I love conversations in office hours with my students where they say, I don't wanna be a part of any of it. I wanna remove myself. And I always say, but we can't, we have to be here. What are we gonna do while we're here? And I wonder if that sparks for you or if you engage in similar chats with your friends and colleagues. What do we do from here? Yeah, like I'm trying to create these semi-autonomous zones in my classroom where the conditions are different than that of the rest of the university. And I think that, you know, if there were enough of us creating these semi-autonomous zones, these zones could actually form together and make like, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe some safer spaces. Uh, so I, I really love the idea of talking through how do we resist in an institution? You know, how do we, um, create irresistible revolution. But that idea comes from Tony K. Babera, but how do we create irresistible revolutions in an institution where the things that we do transform the institution just by the very nature of us being there, pushing back against policy, pushing back against procedure, doing things in new ways, and how does that shift and change the institution? And uh, yeah, I'm really eager to have that conversation. And Chantel Mouffe, writing out of Europe in the early, sort of mid to maybe 2011, 2012, she talks about how institutions have always been spaces of radical discussion and, and not sort of a hotbed of radi radicality, like that institutions aren't only these spaces of like sort of drudgery and you know, trying to steer a, a battleship, you know, uh, that's on a, a set course and how difficult it can be. She's like, no, institutions have always been spaces where we butted up against like change making and staying the same. And, you know, um, what would it mean to lean into that and to say, you know, I'm going to make an institution, the institution, a space for debate, dialogue and discussion about really hard and complex things that might move us forward. Um, and I think part of how we do that is that we stay connected to community. So I'm also really interested in the way that we bring community into our classrooms and the way that classrooms go into community and the ways that we make a bridge uh, and make the walls of the institution more permeable and that we, you know, create, um, like I like when my students get to go and, you know, just literally spend time. I had a course that I was teaching on prison abolition and we had the students for six weeks in, in it was experience education. We had them in for six weeks in community doing work with abolitionist organizations and then coming back and writing about it. And it was really powerful. So anyways, bringing community and the institution together, recognizing the radical possibilities of an institution as a place for, you know, a hotbed of activity and dialogue, and then creating these semi-autonomous zones that allow us to do things in a different way, that very, the very nature of, of which, of doing which, you know, allows the institution to change. Um, and I want to talk about it all the time, you know, I, I think a lot about with my students of color who have often had very negative experiences in the academic setting and I and they you know rightly so they're like I don't think I'm going to try it for a master's or I don't know if I would go for a PhD because I it's hard here it's toxic here and I'm like no we actually need more academics of color we need more trans academics we need more of us in these spaces and so how can I help you to kind of get to the place where um you you feel more supported supported enough to want to come back in and, you know, put the gloves on and try to make some change happen. I love that. Thank you for those tips. And, you know, as you're speaking, it strikes me that, of course, that's some of Niall and my deep motivations and agendas to be together across campuses and across space, thinking about trans studies together is to widen the pod and widen the access and widen the platform from which we can all be playing and, and asking these questions. And I'm, I'm grateful that you are 
willing and able to be with us in these conversations in these ways. I will say that one of the things that um, sort of stuck with me was the ways in which the ways in which you're talking about the academic industrial complex is quite similar to how you were talking about archives. Um, thinking about that cycle and, you know, the seed packets and, you know, the ways in which we want to imagine or reimagine the sort of archive that is academic knowledge, that is institutional knowledge, and then changing it um, in terms of how it impacts future generations. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, and I wish you all so much luck with your class, and I just think, like, we're doing it, you know, we are already doing it. We're already living, we're living as if we're already there. I'm seeing people building community. I'm seeing people build space in these, in these, you know, institutions and changes happening, changes here. So here we go. Yeah. Thanks, Cyrus. Thank you.